Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good. Bright, shiny faces, ready to go. <laughs> yeah. A little too hot this morning there. We'll turn it back down a bit. But you can still hear me, right? Well, I got my hearing aids too. Oh, well, that. <laughs> <laughs> he remembered his glasses and his hearing aids today. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I asked him where his hat was, but it's too hot for him. It's too hot for him. Anyway, good morning and welcome everyone. We love to have fun here. We really do. Um, welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're uh, watching online, please say hi so we know you're there and that you are here with us. Happy Father's Day. And, and I just want everyone to know that every Sunday is the Father's Day. And so we need to celebrate that every Sunday. So this is the day that the Lord has made to let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for the C Rep. Oh, I guess not. For the Bible study that we're going to do as we dig deeper into the engagement project uh, sermon series. And um, this one here, we're going to be going through the vision of God. And this one here is part of that trilogy that we had. So, we were supposed to engage our neighbors. In the engagement project, we're supposed to engage them with truth and wisdom and grace. And so this week, we're going to be hearing about engaging with truth, and we'll do the deep dive on that on Wednesday. This afternoon, and I, I was told by this little bird flew up and told me that it's not going to be really too hot this afternoon, uh, but... We ask uh, that you would join us out at Lowe's Park today at 4 o'clock p.m. We're going to have the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival's flag retirement ceremony. And then we also do our honoring of the uh, veterans who have passed from the prior year in Lynn County. Uh, so I'm happy to announce this year we have 248 names that we have to read this year, which is down from 307 from last year. So that's great news in, in my book. Um, but please join us out there because uh, we honor that military. We thank them for their service and their sacrifice while we're retiring our nation's flags with dignity that they deserve as well. Uh, the ceremony is going to begin with the singing of the national anthem. This year we have the Army uh, 34th Infantry Band that's going to be out there. And so they're actually going to do the national anthem for us and then they will be doing taps at the end of the ceremony then coming up on july 6th we have our men's breakfast at 9 a.m and uh, that's always a great time and then we will be having a private wedding here in the afternoon so men uh, be geared up because we have to shift everything and we're going to be having a uh, we're going to set up the sanctuary lengthwise in here for the wedding uh, with an aisle down the middle. And so we have to arrange the chairs accordingly. And that is going to be the wedding of Carrie Satello and Shane Block, which is Denise's daughters. And so we're going to have that wedding here. And that they will be having a reception. So hopefully um, those invitations will be going out or have gone out. Uh, I know that I brought one in uh, Friday, I guess I met with them. Um, but that should be a really great time and we're very happy. Now, if you listen to Denise and, and you listen to Carrie, because Carrie told me, she said, when she was growing up, she said she was never going to get married. And yet, here she is. She finally found the right person, so we're very happy for her. Following that up on July 13th, we're going to have season 19 of Orange Track Racing again. Uh, we didn't have any races here in June, so we'll be having uh, you know, kind of a double header type thing going on in July. Uh, so we're going to uh, have that as well. And then coming up after we finish up on the engagement project, and I can't believe that we're almost all the way through the engagement project already. Um, then we'll start on the Bible mini series uh, here in July, and we're going to have more information on that coming out and being posted to our, our uh, website as well. And so lots of stuff going on here uh, so it's, it's a great time let's open up with a word of prayer shall we gracious lord and heavenly father we praise you and thank you for this day this father's day your day today as well 
And we thank you that every Sunday is the Father's Day, where we get to honor and bless you with our worship time that we have here. As we enter into this period of worship this morning, Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit to come in and join with us here in this series and to guide and direct our hearts to hear your word and be open to receive that word as well. So as we uh, begin today, Lord, we just praise you and thank you that we are able to gather here today freely and openly to bring honor and glory to you on this the Father's Day as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship this morning that Pastor Terry has chosen for us comes from Ephesians 4.15, and this is from the New Living Translation. And it says, Instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And in here we're talking about truth, and, and as I said uh, in this trilogy series that we went through, we started off with engaging people with grace, and last week was wisdom, and this week we're going to be talking about engaging people with truth. And I'm going to follow form, we're going to learn some Greek today. So, uh, the ancient term for truth in Greek is veritas, and veritas and the the, if you listen to what Jesus says in his messages, and he says, verily, verily, I tell you, this is what he's saying. This is the truth, the basis of truth. So verily is a uh, reflection of that veritas word. And it's the name given to a Roman virtue of truthfulness as well. And it's considered one of the main virtues that any Roman should possess. Paul, even though he wrote this and it was addressed to the church as the family of God when he wrote this in Ephesians, to his letter to the Ephesians, when he wrote this, these verses apply equally then to family and relationships in the home, in the work, and every phase of our life. If we speak the truth in love and grow in every way then in the image of Christ, who is the head of the body, the church, then as we expand that out into every aspect of our life, then we too will then grow in that likeness of Christ. So honesty and helpfulness are encouraged, whereas lying and slander, rage and everything are condemned as we find in the Bible and through here, because that would separate you from Christ, not bring you more into the image of Christ. But speaking the truth can have several meanings, and uh, it can be a a reflection of your character. So if you're speaking out and you're speaking in truth, then people are going to see that and that's a reflection of your character. But it also can be tough love. If you have to speak that truth out of love, it can be a tough love. So sometimes it's that message that someone really needs to hear. But what are we supposed to do? We learned last week that we were to flavor that speech then with salt or to enhance our relationships, we can't enhance those relationships, that speech, if we use it without enhancement of that speech. So you have to speak that out of truth, love, with wisdom and grace. So let us pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you that uh, for the message that you've given Pastor Terry to share with us today. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us ears to hear and hearts to accept this message and then put it upon our spirits to live it out each and every day of our life so that we can be that reflection of you, that representation of you. Thank you, Christ Jesus, and all these things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning and happy Father's Day. Now, Mark, I know we changed, we got finally got the colors changed out, but on the video on the screen that you're looking at, uh -huh. it's going in and it pops up a green. I don't know if it's just trying to t remind us or what that deal is, but it's not doing it on any other feed, so it's just the computer, so don't be surprised. Techie right. guys, we get all worried about things when we see them, and we're gonna <laughs> call it out. Well, with this being Father's Day, I know, uh, it's still pretty fresh for both Mark and I. Last year we both lost our fathers. And uh, 
it comes with mixed emotions. And that can be for many different reasons. Your father may no longer be with you, as is our, the case for us. Father may not be present. Maybe your father wasn't a good father. Or maybe you have a wonderful father. The one thing that we do have is our Father in Heaven. And as we were coming in, driving in this morning, what song should pop on the radio? But Chris Tomlin's Good, Good Father. How appropriate. Well, God, fortunately, unlike our earthly fathers, will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. Psalm 27.10 tells us that even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. And in Psalm 65.15, it tells us that God is the father to the fatherless. I ran across uh, something that Rachel Lovingood wrote. Called, she wrote, God is our model father. And in it, she talks about how God is the perfect example of what it means to be a dad by tying some of the characteristics that set him apart. And what she did is she took father and she used that. So we'll start with F, forgiveness. It's a huge part of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is willing and able to forgive us for any sin that we commit, we just need to ask. That's very comforting. A, he's active in your life at all times. God is always at work around you. Ask God to show you what he's doing. You'll be amazed at what's going on. I mean, we look out and we ask God what he's doing. Well, since the derecho four years ago, now we can look out and we see trees that are full of leaves again. More important, there's an invitation that is open for you to get involved with him, which is something we're going to talk about in just a moment when we get to the sermon. T is for time with you. As humans, we have a tendency to be too busy for this or that, but God has time for you all the time. Whenever you feel lonely or you're struggling or you have a problem or you want to share a thought, a need or a concern, he's there. You can't find a time in your day when he is too busy. H, well, that's the heart of the matter. God knows our hearts, and he loves us anyway. That's the neat part. Proverbs tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. Some people may not want to be in your life, especially if we make mistakes. But God wants to be with you anytime, anywhere, all the time. E, everywhere, sums up God's place in your life. If you're a Christian, there is nowhere you can go where he isn't with you. It can be encouraging to realize that when you are in a tough spot in your life, he is right there with you, whether anyone else is or not. God is by your side. And finally, R, it, it, it's, a, it's not a stutter, there's two of them. It's read, or rest and read. These are two areas where most people could use a little bit of work. Rest is important because it's easy to become so busy that you don't take time to be with the Lord. This past week, I looked at Diane on Thursday and I said, I just, I barely keep my eyes open on the way home after I dropped the guys off. I just, and then Thursday night, I went to bed at like, I'm a midnight, 11, 12 o'clock night, that's when I go to bed, get up at five. I was in bed at seven and I did not wake up again until 5.15 the next morning. We have to rest. And God also wants us to set aside daily time to be in his word. It's his love letter to us. It's the best way to get to know him. All these attributes of God's character make him who he is. And if you have been blessed with an earthly dad who has a lot in common with our heavenly father, be grateful. If you've missed out on a relationship with an earthly dad, be thankful that God is there for you and wants to meet the needs in your life. Let God know how much he means to you. And that leads us into our sermon this morning. And we are still in the vision. We are still in the epic of engagement. And we are engaging with truth. All these things that we just read about God as the Father are truth. Don't put it this way. We are journeying through an epic in which we are currently living and operating. But what does that look like? In the message on engaging with grace, Pastor Mark asked, if we are going to go and do, and, he, and in his notes he put go and do in caps, 
If we are going to go and do, then why, who, when, and where? God has placed us where we're at for a reason. Mark and I were talking about this morning about something totally different, but God has placed us where we're at for a reason. The teaching went on to go over the events from Saul watching Stephen being stoned to his conversion. And, and, and i got to believe his conversion started before he was on the road to Damascus. It, it may have just been getting started, or he may have been a jump start when he watched Stephen. But it went into high gear as he walked to Damascus. And we are learning to live, and we got to go back a few weeks for this, but we're learning to live by the royal law. That royal law is the law of neighbor love. Now, from changing the world one person at a time, we heard the message last week on engaging with wisdom. We, have, we, can, we can't just step out and engage a dozen people all at once. Let's try doing it one person at a time. Mark delved deeper into understanding what wisdom is and how we get it and how it is best applied to the task of steadfastly seeking the true good or shalom of the one who providentially lives nearby. It's no coincidence that this morning as I'm reading, I am reading of uh, Solomon asking God, wisdom. With that said, let's go back to the vision that we talked about earlier in this series. The vision. It says, Christian families committed to the shalom of our neighbors. We will build real relationships with those providentially in our Jerusalem through prayer and action with grace and wisdom and truth. Being attractively winsome, tearing down walls, building up trust, and doing the work of the kingdom. So before we go too much further, let's jump back just a little bit to the scripture from our call to worship and to what was happening at the time. See, in Ephesians 4, Paul starts off writing to the church about how in order to live like Christ, we must have unity in the body. There's a denomination out there that re this past week had little unity in the body. There's a, a big battle brewing over a specific tenet of their faith. Not something out of the scriptures, but just out of their doctrine. And it's caused a lot of issues. But moving past that, when we talk about unity, let's talk about giftedness. I, I love talking to people all week long. It's the only reason I don't go stir crazy being a, working from home alone. In talking to them, they say, oh, you're so good at this. I'm so glad. And I have to remind them, yeah, I'm good at this, but look at all the things that you're good at. You're gifted at things that I can do. I've talked to guys that are in construction, plumbers. I do not do plumbing at all. I'll touch electricity, I'll touch, touch wires, I'll do cat five, I'll, I'll string network cable. I will not touch plumbing because I make a mess. Literally. But we're all gifted. And what Paul's talking about is that we're all gifted for the church or the work of the church. It's also what makes life work. Yes, being a jack of all trades and a master of none and sometimes can be okay. But not always. We should stop focusing on what we can't do. So I don't focus on what I can't do, which is plumbing and other things. What I need to focus on, what we need to focus on, is what God can do. What can God do? So let's go back and look at the uh, passage, uh, starting uh, Ephesians 4, starting verse 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, 
measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced. When people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of it, his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So something to think about after hearing that. Do you realize, and I don't believe that to be anybody here, but there are people out there that simply go to church for their own personal benefit. They treat God like their own personal genie. Like they can just rub the lamp and get what they want. And that's not only in church. It happens in all aspects of our lives. People are out for their own personal benefit. What can I get out of this? What can I get out of this relationship with this person? What if I toss around this person's name and their title? What can I do to get this or that? I think people are self-serving opportunists. What's in it for me? Remains me of King David's son, Adonijah. He decided, King David is, is laying in bed near the end of his life, and Adonijah decides that he's going to make himself king for his own personal benefit. He already knows that David is going to make Solomon king. So he wants to get a head start on it and supersede it, kind of like his brother had done. He thought he could be the next king over Judah and Israel. That didn't go so well for him. He had his little festive meal with a bunch of people and he got everybody stirred up but in the end especially when he asked for the virgin who laid with David to keep him warm you have to go read the scriptures about that uh, but he wanted to marry her and <laughs> Solomon's like yeah no you're done his self-serving opportunistic ways did not serve him well. <clears throat> if we go back to this passage, Paul is telling us in this passage that we are each saved by God to be equipped for the work of ministry and for being of service to others. So if God has equipped us and planted us where we are, then the question is, what if every committed Christian family began to engage those neighbors that were providentially around them? We've heard Dell say this a few times. We are called by grace to use the wisdom that God gives us to speak truth into the lives of those around us. Now, if you're like me, as soon as I hear the word truth, the first thing that comes to mind is a movie, a Few Good Men. And you might remember when Colonel Jessup is there in the courtroom and he shouts at Lieutenant Caffey, you can't handle the truth. Well, there is truth in that. What is truth? For a lot of people, handling truth is a huge issue. When it comes to the question, what is truth? A lot of people would rather not have the answer. They don't like the answer. And unfortunately, as our society slips further and further, we're moving away from absolute truth to something called relative truth. And when we start talking to people and we want to share the truth and love, there's a, it's going to be hard because they're living in that relative truth. So let's define relative truth so you understand what I'm talking about. It's the concept that what a person believes is dependent on their own perspectives and on their own context. So a person's truth can be subjective, conditional, contradictory, and it can even vary over time. 
Everybody is asking for truth. And in John 18, 37 and 38, Jesus is standing before Pilate when he is asked, first Pilate says, so you are a king. And Jesus responds, yes, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. And all who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And Pilate then asks, what is true? Jesus is true. Pilate's looking for truth, as is everyone. I can tell you what truth is not. It's not relative. It's not whatever works for you. It's not what makes people feel good. It's not what the majority say is true. Just because 10 people say it's true and one says it's not does not make it true. Just because someone gives a long presentation and gives all these reasons doesn't make it true. Good intentions can still be false. Merriam-Webster defines truth as that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. Like it or not, truth is real. It is what it is, and yep, it can hurt. Anybody had somebody speak truth to them and it kind of hurt a little bit, stung? I know I have. And sadly, what many people do not think about with their thoughts on relative truth is that there are real life consequences for being wrong. Not only real life consequences, but eternal consequences. Going back to Ephesians 4.15, where it said, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Truth is what God says about it. And truth shouldn't be used like a hammer. It shouldn't be used to beat people up. And when I think of that, I think of, of hellfire and brimstone preaching. Or turn and burn, turn or burn type preaching. Truth has to be smoke, spoken with love. Unlike hellfire and brimstone or turn or burn, how, what you say, in order to speak truth and love, can't be done that way. First, we have to have a relationship. That's why we've been talking about figuring out who your neighbor is. That's why that has been so important. And to speak compassionately when we talk to someone, righteously and responsibly. We need to keep in mind the well-being of those who are hearing it. We have to be committed to the, God's truth because Satan, the father of lies, will try to twist and turn it any way possible. He will help you take it out of context, twist it and turn it, make it sound like it's real, like it should be truth, when it's not. Words matter. Tone matters. Body language matters. Actions matter. You're standing talking to somebody trying to speak truth to them, you got your arms folded, they're going to think, you know, you're not being sincere. It's kind of, I've got to talk to this person. We need to speak truth and love. And it won't always be easy. And it's not always convenient, and certainly not always pleasant. But it is always necessary. So this takes us back to the discussions we've had in this series about getting to know our neighbors. It goes back to our discussions about agape love, that sacrificial love. Truth and agape love are both absolutely necessary when we're talking to our neighbors. Truth is spoken through grace and wisdom. That's why they came before truth. Why Mark had those messages the last couple of weeks. And, and when they're spoken that way, they're spoken in a context of a deep, significant relationship. And as we seek to develop those relationships, we need to do so with no other agenda. Put the agendas aside, other than to love them. Anything else, any other agenda, is going to destroy that relationship. 
It's not a project. It is true, genuine friendship done with love. This past Wednesday night, we heard about a couple from the previous uh, Engaging in Wisdom. We heard about a couple who got to know their neighbor, moved in the best house in the neighborhood, and but nobody really wanted to socialize with this person. Nobody wanted to get to know him. And they, through walking their dog, got to know him. Everything changed, though, when the DEA knocked on their door, if you remember that. He was running a meth lab. He's now sitting in prison. But they kept reaching out to him. Agape love. Speaking truth. And it's because of that that he has found God. Now, he found out the truth of his consequences of his actions as well. He's probably going to spend a good couple decades in prison. But his newly found faith and the hope it brings will help him to get through it. And they continue to go through that. And they continue... And, 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 and I don't remember the husband's name, but he's become the neighborhood pastor. And people are coming to him and more to complain about how could you befriend this person? How can you still talk to him? Not understanding that getting to know your neighbor, just like speaking truth and love, isn't always convenient. It's not always easy. So the question is, is this something that you could do? And I would say not on your own. They didn't do it on their own. It took God. And it also takes a community of believers sharpening one another. God has his role and we have ours. What's ours? Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 and 26. Where it says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be able and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. But they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. It was Timothy's job as a teacher to help those confused by what, and by what was truth and to teach them God's truth. When you're teaching someone God's truth, quarreling with them will not help them to see it. Being anything but kind will get them to shut down and fast. Good teaching will never promote that kind of quarreling or foolish arguments. When people have questions, stop. Really listen and hear what they are asking or saying. And if you want to be respected, you have, must also respect the other person. If they oppose the truth, Paul tells us to gently instruct them, not beat them up, not that hammer, gently instruct them. Yelling and screaming over the top of each other, have you ever had one of those conversations? Did it get anywhere other than a bad place for you both? No. Those are the kind of foolish exchanges that get us nowhere and only leave us frustrated and upset. If the other person is frustrated and upset, do you really think they're going to listen to anything you have to say? You're not going to listen to anything they have to say when you're that upset. By following Paul's teachings in this passage, others are more likely to listen to what you have to say. They might still reject it, but the seed was planted. Now, any of you know the uh, comedy illusionist team, Penn and Teller? Penn Gillette is a professed atheist. But in 2009, he told a story on a, in a YouTube video about the gift of a Bible. In the video, he's talking about this man who came up to him after a show and handed him a Bible. He makes it very clear he doesn't believe in God, but this is what Penn said. 
I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could go, be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me alone and keep religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? And he finishes it by saying, I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe the truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. As far as I know to this day, he still doesn't believe. But he had respect for this person for coming up and sharing with him in love caring about him. Just like that man, we are Christ's ambassadors. Let's look at our last scripture here from 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 20. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you get them? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems cra we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. And since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old self. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. God's going to respond to us when we walk by faith. But talking by faith, just talking about it, that's not going to get you anywhere. If we are truly taking God seriously, then we should be speaking truth to our neighbors. We should be concerned about our neighbor's eternal destination. Those who are worried more about themselves should be avoided. Again, I threw out King David's son, Adonijah. He's in it for himself. Everything that Paul and those with him did was to honor God. And that's what you're going to find here at Grace Street Church. We want you to know the truth. We want you to know the grace that God has given us and the gift of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We want you to have the same hope that we have and the same passion for sharing that with your neighbors. Again, I ask you to remember the royal law from James 2.8. Love your neighbor as yourself. It boils down to simply love God, love people. God has entrusted us with the primary work of the kingdom. Each of us. So what are you going to do today to love your neighbor? To do that, 
I give you a challenge. And this goes to the basic tenets of that our church is founded on. Prayer, care, and share. So I challenge you to start by praying for your neighbors. As you do, listen to what God is saying, even if it's not comfortable. Then take the time to care. Oh, by the way, might not be comfortable either. Then, when the time is right, and God will show you that, share the truth in love with the same grace and wisdom that was shared with you. One neighbor at a time. Father, engaging others in truth with even with your grace and your wisdom can be difficult. It can be scary. Some of us are extroverted. Some of us are, uh, are not. And, and others of us are somewhere in between. Talking to others isn't always easy. But Father, too often we try to do it on our own. And we forget that we need to come to you. Remind us daily, Father, that we can't do anything unless it is through you. Help us, Father, as we pray for our neighbors. Pray for those opportunities to meet them if we don't already know them. Then, Father, show us how we can care for them. Maybe that's helping to mow the yard, shovel snow, whatever that is. Show us what you would have us do. And, Father, then when the time is right, let us share truth in love with your grace and your wisdom. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we prepare for this time of communion this morning, I want you to think about that veritas, the truth. And Jesus told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And we hear a lot in, the, in some of the modern day speak in a lot of the churches is that, well, you know, as long as you're doing good works, you can get to heaven. And it's these partial truths or half truths, or it is their uh, truth that they want to hang on to because it's easier to tell people that than actually having to make a commitment to Christ in their lives. <coughs> and the truth is, the veritas of the situation is, there's only one way, and that is through a life commitment to Jesus Christ. That's it. He paid the price for our sins, for our disobedience. He ransomed us out of death into life on the cross. And that is the truth. That is the veritas of the situation. So as we speak our truth to our neighbors, as we bring them in. We, we should want to bring anyone who is outside of the truth to bring them into that truth so that they can get to know that truth. Because that is the only way that they will have everlasting life. And that is what Jesus was teaching the disciples, especially in that meeting up to the week before he was crucified. He was letting them know that Hey, it's on us to go out and do the work. It's on you to take this truth and speak it to the nations, go into all the nations, making disciples of all peoples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is what he was commanding his disciples to do. So on the night that he was given up, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, 
This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he blessed the cup and he filled it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And the scripture goes on to tell us that he furthermore said that uh, we are to take of the bread and the cup until he returns again each time that we gather. And that's why we do that every week here at Grace Street Church. It's because we are here to honor that and to remember. We are to do this in remembrance of that sacrifice. So it keeps that truth fresh in our minds. Fresh in our spirit so that we don't stray away become our relative truth. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. So, Steve and Denise are traveling. They're uh, over at his mother's this week. And uh, they have some relatives that came in from town. Um, and so they're meeting with them and kind of trying to figure out what next steps are going to be for them. And uh, we ask a blessing upon them as they're traveling there and back and that they have a fruitful meeting with the relatives and everything for the weekend here. And so uh, we want to have prayers for those. Uh, on top of that, Denise uh, lost her Aunt Betty last Monday. And so we found out about that Wednesday night. Uh, and she was his, her dad's last sister. And so the only one left in the family then is her dad's uh, younger brother. And so he's 87 years old. He's very sad, very depressed that he is the very last one. And uh, so we asked some prayers upon, for, uh, upon him for care and comfort and for God's peace, his shalom, to overcome the entire family. They've, they've been going through some real struggles lately. Uh, also, we had in our prayers today that Be uh, from Becky that Chloe's been running a high fever all week. And I guess as of last night, she posted up that if Chloe's not getting any better, then she's going to have to take her into the ER. And uh, so we asked for prayers for them. Uh, they've been struggling with sickness quite a bit. I'm very happy to see you back in here with us this morning, Deb. I know that you've been struggling with sickness and everything. And Joe, welcome back. Uh, happy Father's Day to everyone. And uh, so let's take this time to go to God in prayer. Is there anyone else that needs anyone else lifted up at this point in time? I'd just like to say a little prayer for all those who don't know Christ's name. They'll, they'll find him this week. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. I need to pray for my brother Francis. He was just put into assisted living. He's 85, dealing with some dementia, Alzheimer's. Okay. Went in Thursday. It's pretty, pretty tough stuff. Yeah. Okay. So for Francis, we'll be praying for him as well. Anyone else? Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We submit these names to you. We submit these problems, these issues that are plaguing the families. We ask for your wisdom, your strength, and your comfort to come upon them today. We ask as you are the great physician that we come against these diseases, we come against the sicknesses, the illnesses, and the hurts, and the injuries. We rebuke them in your holy name today, and we claim them as a victory in your name that you will uh, do a mighty act of healing in their lives. Lord, you know the healing that they need. You know the healing that you wish to do in their lives. And we just ask that you would be present in their lives and present with the caregivers to give them the healing that they need and that they want, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for this message that we heard this morning. And we ask that, uh, Lord, you use that to heal our mind and heal our spirit so that we would know that you are the truth and that you came to us in truth so that we could know the truth through you. So Father God, we just 
ask today for a special blessing on all those who are present here, whether they are online or in person. We ask for travel mercies for those who are going to be traveling. We ask for uh, softening of hearts for those who have had a, a bad relationship with their father today as we are celebrating Father's Day today. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you can come upon all these families and where there's reconciliation and healing that is needed, that you would give them that healing. And for those who are going through this first Father's Day in the absence of their father, Lord, we ask for your care and comfort to surround them and bless them today. So we just praise you and thank you in all these things. We thank you that you are the truth and that we can live that truth out by representing you to others each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. As we close out this portion of our service, the online portion of our service, I'm going to read to you uh, a Father's Day prayer, or poem. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities, and there was nothing more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it dead. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for all the fathers and father figures in our lives. Good or bad, active or not, we pray for them as no one on earth besides your son Jesus has ever been perfect. Thank you for the fathers who have been there. Bless them and encourage them. For the fathers who have not, Lord, we pray for a changed heart. There are also many single fathers, Lord. We pray for their strength, for their perseverance, and the love to raise their children despite the difficulties they may face. Give them wisdom, discernment, protection for their health, and for an ever-deepening faith in you that will pass, they will pass on to their children. For those who are not present, Lord, we pray that whatever the circumstances, that you would change them and allow them to see how they can build a healthy relationship with their children. Remove all barriers that prevent this from happening. Lord, we also pray for all the soon-to-be fathers and new fathers. We pray that they will follow in your footsteps because you are the greatest role model of a father. May they grow to become more and more Christ-like each and every day, leading their households to draw closer to you. Remove all fear, remove all worries, remove anything that would not let them focus on your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness and love. We lift all the fathers in the world up to you. In Jesus' name, amen.